Good afternoon, everyone. This is Trip Vanderwall, a member of Miller Johnson's Employee Benefits Practice Group. Uh, welcome to our monthly uh, we monthly benefits lunch break webinar uh, on December fifteenth, the last one of twenty twenty one. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, I think we have a special webinar prepared for you today. I think you know we're all excited. We have the whole benefits group uh, here today, and we actually have a special guest, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, few housekeeping items. Uh, thank you for your responses to our surveys about what you know whether you thought these webinars were value and if you wanted us to continue to do them uh, in 2022. Uh, we looked at the survey results and decided we are going to continue them and we are going to continue them on a monthly basis. Uh, we will have some changes in where um, we will try to address, I think, a little bit more a wide range of topics and it maybe even include some more training or basic level training with respect to benefits in these webinars, but we will advertise those uh, as um, as we get closer to the date. So the good news or bad news is you probably won't hear me every single month in 2022 like you did in 2021. All right. So as, as previously indicated, this is Ask a Benefits Attorney. We did solicit uh, questions in advance, and we are probably going to tackle those first. Uh, but again, please use that Q&A feature to submit additional questions or or additional follow-up questions on, on topics we, we selected. Uh, with me today, you can see everybody. Uh, we have Frank Baradin, uh, Jim Brunsma, Jeff Gray, Brett Leafbrower, uh, Brett Swergen, and then myself, Trip Vanderwall. And with that, let's finally introduce today's special guest moderator. I will tell you, I got a couple emails with predictions. I did not reveal this source to anyone, but at least two or three people emailed me the correct one. So our special guest is we're welcoming Mary Bowman back. <laughs> she is with us in person, and we are in a, here in a minute going to switch on the camera. So the one big difference will be um, that we will be on, on camera today. So this is this is Mary before <laughs> retiring uh, in 2022 uh, when she left left us in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> uh, she did it. She did tell me. I think she, almost two years to the date that you were going to retire before you did it. Yeah. But I think when you told me that, I didn't have any idea. <laughs> when you'd be in the midst of no, COVID no, no, uh, no, when, no. when you left. So, uh, and here's Mary <laughs> Bauman now today enjoying her retirement. And that's one of her grandkids. That's um, Tab, correct, yeah, Mary? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, with that, welcome back, Mary. Um, and Mary is going to be moderating for us. So she will be reading the questions, kind of directing them. We're hoping that this is conversational in nature. Um, we agreed to go 45 minutes. Uh, and we will do that. We will go up to 45 minutes and address as many questions. If we run out, we'll probably end early. But as I was mentioning before the webinar, I've never gotten a complaint uh, when we've gotten through the material faster than, you know, in a half an hour or less. So with that, we'll get started. Okay. So our first question um, is regarding flexible spending accounts. And uh, the question is, when will employees be able to make changes to their flexible spending accounts in 22, 2022? Will it be the same as 2021 uh, because of changes the, the, the changes that were made due to the pandemic? Um, they allowed their employees to make changes to their FSA in 2021, but does that still apply in 2022? Um, I think, Brett, maybe you were ready to answer that question. Sure. I'll kick us off today. So hello, everyone on the line. My name is Brett Leifbrauer, as, as Tripp mentioned, and the short answer to the question is no. Uh, there has been no indication from Congress or the IRS uh, that they will extend any of the temporary relief for medical or dependent care flexible spending accounts uh, that was available in 2021 into 2022. And just as a quick reminder of what some of that temporary relief was, for the 2021 plan year, employers were allowed but not required to permit participants in medical and dependent care FSAs to start, stop, increase, or decrease their FSA elections for any reason. Uh, however, those election changes had to be prospective. And for medical FSAs, uh, those changes could not decrease the election amount to less than the individual had already been reimbursed for that plan year. So Brett, even though maybe an employer wants to be nice, 
and allow that to continue in 2022 unless we get some guidance from the feds, they can't, right? That's correct. Without uh, statutory language from Congress or IRS guidance, uh, they just can't do it. That relief will no longer be available. And I think some, you know, we, some history about how these changes came around might be helpful. We've got the first kind of round of flexibility just through IRS, you know, informal IRS guidance. It was a notice released, I think, sometime in late spring of 2020. Uh, and then the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which was signed in December of 2020, actually made some of these temporary changes um, in the actual legislation or in the statutes themselves. Um, those were all temporary in the statute, so we'd need some additional action by Congress to extend those, which they haven't done yet. Um, and I have been on some webinars with IRS officials that they do think things have maybe not calmed down, but it's not as much as a surprise. We're kind of, we've grown to live with this. So they do not anticipate extending that additional flexibility. So, you know, uh, except for the fact that maybe you can have, you know, a, a unlimited carryover, a 12 month carryover from your 2021 to 2022 plan year, uh, that flexibility is going away beginning your 2022 plan year. So you're, if you're going to change an election, it's back to like you were in 2019. You have to have a certain event that permits that mid-year election change. Okay. Uh, let's switch gears to go on the retirement side. Um, this client's auditor told us we deferred 401k deferrals late and thus per DOL regs, we, should, uh, we have a prohibited transaction. Um, can you comment if we should file IRS form 5330 to correct or uh, use the DOL's uh, um, voluntary fiduciary correction program or both? Um, I don't know, Frank or Jeff, if you want to comment on that. I'll take that one, Mary. Thank you. So we get this question uh, pretty much every year this comes up. The auditors out of the plans, our clients contact us about this. Uh, the short answer is, in most cases, both. Uh, but not always. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, when you have late deferrals in a 401k plan, really you have two problems. You have a breach of fiduciary duty under ERISA, and then you also have a prohibited transaction under ERISA and the Internal Revenue Code. So these two items really address those two issues almost separately. IRS Form 5330 is really the form that you use to pay the excise tax on the prohibited transaction. But if you only do that, you're not addressing the fiduciary duty issues that the DOL is concerned about. So that's why you file uh, under the DOL's Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program. And thankfully, that program, which is very, pretty simple to use, uh, and it's, it's free to use, um, you fill out some forms, which we can help you with, um, you contribute lost earnings, and then as part of that process, you also tell the DOL whether or not you're going to file IRS Form 5330. So you really address both of those situations at the same time when you go through the DOL's Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program. The other reason to do it, too, is because if, if, if your auditor found this issue, it's going to report that issue on your Form 5500 uh, for, the, for the filing year. So sometimes we've seen DOL audits that have come out of uh, kind of uncorrect, we suspect anyway, out of uncorrected continued late remittances of payrolls and loan, loan contributions, loan repayments on the Form 5500. So it's good to take care of it. Um, if you also, if you go through the DOL's fiduciary correction program, there's, a, there's an exemption that you can take up to actually avoid filing Form 5330 if you, it, you know, if you qualify for it. So if your late deferrals are no more than 180 days late. And um, in, in that case, you can uh, basically notify the participants and notify the DOL about the correction you're making under the correction program and avoid filing Form 5330. And if the excise tax actually is less than $100, you can just contribute that excise tax to the plan without communicating to the participants or the DOL. So if you do either of those things, you can avoid fi uh, filing Form 5330, which frankly is a difficult form to, to complete, especially if you have multiple years at issue. Um, the, 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 the twist with that though is that you can only use that exemption once every, once every three years. So in short, uh, most cases do both. And Brett here is, a, is an expert at these. I That's think he's awesome. done like 20 this year or something. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, before I retired, I would have found that 
explanation riveting and now it's almost like I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I know. it's just it's crazy it's crazy yeah, it's crazy the 5330 still gives me nightmares though about how challenging that for or just frustrating that form is yeah, hours and hours of attorney time to pay four dollars in excise yeah. tax yeah. yeah. it's crazy illogical um well on a maybe brighter note um is there anything good coming and let's first talk about the famous build back better proposed law if that law is enacted um any benefit changes inside that law that we should be aware of jim you have some comments on that yes um hi everyone i'm jim brunsbaum a member of the employee benefit practice group um I'm not going to limit my comments to the Build Back Better law, but there, well, you know what? Maybe let's just talk about Build Back Better first, okay, and then we can go first. on to other stuff. So, okay, you, you the Build Back Better law, I think that the, the changes are mainly negative because they're, they're uh, trying to raise money, and so that I think they're talking about imposing RMD requirements on Roth 401k and for, or for, for Roth IRAs. Uh, limiting how large an, a Roth IRA can be before you're required to take money out, et cetera, mm -hmm. which are designed to be revenue raisers. But there's a, another other legislation uh, that's pending that would have some positive things for retirement plans. But okay. if, Anybody um, on the health and welfare side, anything on the Build Back Better? Yeah, I would, I would guess. I don't know if I have any, any positive things to tell you, great impacts, other than, you know, for those of you who have heard me harp on now for a year almost, and all the, the health and welfare provisions under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the nice thing is that the Build Back Better Act, at least in its current form, and remember, it hasn't passed yet, um, does not seem to have a large direct impact on employer-sponsored group health plans, um, you know, which I think most of you are aware was not the case with the CAA or the Consolidated Appropriations Act. I would say maybe the biggest notable exception is uh, for those of you that are large employers and subject to what we call the pay or play penalty, you know that you have to offer you know, minimum value affordable coverage uh, and whether it's affordable, you can uh, depend on one of three different safe harbors, uh, but typically the, the safe harbor percentage will be changed in index for inflation every year. I think it actually went down from 9.8 something to 9.61 this year. Correct, Brad? I don't, I don't, I should have those numbers at the top of my head. But Right. So the current projected affordability percentage for 2022 was going to be 9.61. Okay. And that was actually a drop from 2021. What the Build Back Better Act does, though, is sets it at a flat 8.5% for, I think, uh, a, a length of 10 years. Um, so not only is it going to be lower than what it initially was, it's not going to be adjusted for inflation. Uh, so if you think about that, you know, as you're making health, your health insurance coverage affordable, cost increases are going to be more on the employer than, and, and not so much easily passed through uh, to the employees. Now, keep in mind, only your offer of employee-only coverage uh, has to be affordable. But if you think about, if you're kind of playing real close to those levels and you miss it for some employees, you may have other, you may have these employees who can, are able to go to the exchange, get a premium tax credit and trigger one of these penalties, especially since there's playing on, on permanently getting rid of this 400% cap. You know, I got to say the nice thing about it doing it at 8.5% is it gives employers certainty and they can plan better. I right. mean, otherwise right. you get those adjustments and, and we don't get them till November. Right. So it's, you know, it's a tight, yeah, especially for a calendar plan. Mm -hmm. It's a tight, it's a tight fix. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So uh, other legislation, Jim, that's pending. Yes. There is other benefits legislation that goes by the acronym secure 2.0. This is another law that's designed to enhance retirement savings. There are a number of provisions in that law. Once again, this is pending, supposedly has bipartisan support, but we'll see. Um, one of the provisions would say be that for a new 401k or 403b plan, you would be required to include automatic enrollment and automatic increases in contributions on an annual basis. I believe grant, existing plans are grandfathered from that, but that's one of the proposals going forward. Another thing they've talked about, and this is something that's had some press in the past, is that if you have someone making student loan payments, that those loan payments would be treated like elective deferrals to the plan so that the employer could make matching contributions based on those student loan payments. 
Another change they talked about is increasing the age at which required minimum distributions would begin uh, to increase from 72 to 75 over a period of time and perhaps exempt those with small balances. Uh, I think that they talked about maybe anything under $100,000, there wouldn't be any R&Ds. Uh, they also talked about increasing catch-up contributions. So currently, that's $6,500. They talked about for people in their 60s uh, who are approaching retirement age, that might be increased to $10,000. So there are things that are in this secure 2.0 that I think many employers would view as a positive improvement and are designed to enhance retirement savings. Okay. That's good. Frank, we're going to move to a retirement-related uh, question. What is the status of backdoor Roth IRAs and backdoor Roth 401ks? So that's another provision that's in the Build Better Act, uh, and it's gone, or Build Back Better Act, that, um, <laughs> <laughs> that has gone back and forth, and um, we don't really know right now. Um, clearly, there is a desire to eliminate, you know, it's like anytime some new tax strategy gets published and promoted in the Wall Street Journal, um, you usually see some legislation introduced to eliminate that within a few weeks. And this was that kind of thing. There was an article about doing these backdoor Roths where people would make large after-tax contributions to their 401k plan and, and then immediately convert them to Roth and it was a way for generally higher income people to get a lot larger uh, contribution into Roth. Um, it generated a lot of excitement. A lot of people called, but then the reality is it's not so easy to get after-tax contributions into a qualified plan if you're a highly compensated employee because there are non-discrimination rules. So it's not as widespread as what people had hoped. But for employers that could offer that and employees that could contribute, it's been a, a very nice benefit. So of course, there's a proposal to get rid of it. Um, it was originally proposed to be eliminated in 2021 uh, because of the delay in adopting the uh, act. It's likely that that won't happen until 2022. So some people may still wanna try to take advantage of it for 21, but um, that is, if, if Build Better uh, passes, it will be gone at the end of 2022. And then there's a separate provision that would prevent Roth conversions by any people making above a certain income level. And so that would include pre-tax money that you just want to convert to Roth. Uh, but that's not scheduled to be, uh, become effective until 2031, which I think is ridiculous because by 2031, you know, they could have completely <laughs> changed the whole tax laws, but it's a way to it promote that it's going right. to raise some revenue to pay for something else 10 years. So, okay. Now I, I, this isn't in the questions, you guys, I'm just going to throw you guys a curveball here. What about Peter Thiel and his HSA? Do you know what I'm talking about there? Did he, you, did he have an HSA? I knew he had a I Roth. Didn't know it a Roth. Was a it a Roth? Roth and Roth. he put Five an incredible, yes. yes. So yeah. is part that of this the, in response to yes. Peter Thiel, the outrage <laughs> of Peter Thiel? Yes. Right. There are also some provisions that would start mandating uh, distributions for people that have above a certain income right. level. I mean, Jim and I were talking about this earlier. It's it's silly because it's designed really, it's not going to raise enough revenue no. to do anything. It's no. just and, designed. And, and the ability of somebody like to replicate what Peter Thiel did is really low, right? Yeah, right. Yes. I mean, yes. it, it's really no different than some of the tax breaks we have for venture capital right now, where if you risk this money and you put it in some cases, there's no income taxes paid at all if you hold mm -hmm. it a certain amount of time. So this is just one of those things that's the optics of it. It looks bad. They want to you know, put some penalties on people to say they're doing something. Yep. But, um, there you have it. Okay, Trip. All right. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan has continued to refuse to provide their self-funded clients with analysis regarding mental health and substance abuse, non-quantitative treatment limitations. I still remember what that there was. Uh, required by um, CAA 2021. What recommendations do you have, as Miller Johnson have, regarding vendors that are willing to provide this analysis? Yeah, so this has been a 
significant source of frustration for a lot of my self-funded clients. Um, quick, back, quick background is, is most group health plans have to comply with this Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, and there's, you know, we can't get into all what that means, but one part of that is that the non-quantitative treatment limitations, which is any limitation that basically does not apply on a quantitative level. So think prior authorization, concurrent review, network advocate or adequate status, uh, you know, prescription drug formularies. Uh, these, those are all NQTLs. And basically how a plan applies these NQTLs uh, has to be, you know, no more burdensome. There's a whole phrase that goes along with it than how the plan applies that with to the medical surgical and benefits. Um, so we all, th this, that requirement has been around for a while, I think since at least 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Consolidated Appropriations Act has basically said, you need to have this documented and written analysis of your plans and QTLs. And th it directs the department uh, to actually solicit at least 20 of these each year. Um, and where they find non-compliance, uh, you basically have to alert your participants in a notice that your plan does not comply with the mental health That's parity. That's new since I retired. And your name goes on a publicly disclosed list to Congress. You go on a naughty list. <laughs> and so, and unfortunately, what we've heard from the DOL, this is a high priority, and mental health parity is a high mm -hmm. priority for them. Uh, so if you are unlucky enough to get one of these requests, now I think they are directing it to where they've heard complaints, but it doesn't right. mean it couldn't be completely random. Right. But so, but so if Blue Cross won't do this analysis, yeah. where do we, where yeah. do we go? So I, I'll get there. So you got like 20 days to get back. <laughs> we only have 45 I know, I know. So anyway, so a lot of these self-funded plans, you know, I, you, you as a plan sponsor don't necessarily have the knowledge of what, what even your NQTLs or, or how they came up with these. And these have to be fairly robust analysis. So um, there are some other vendors out there. I hear some of the bigger consulting firms will do this, but it comes at a giant price tag. Mm -hmm. Um, I am seeing some movement in what, you know, some of these TBAs are providing to their clients. I think they're trying to come on board. They're just not being real quick about it. The last thing that I saw from, from the Blues was much better than what I saw a year ago. Uh, but I had another client that worked with their TBA and said, listen, we know our plan is basically based on one of your fully insured underwritten plan. You had to do your own comparative analysis for that plan. Can you give us that comparative analysis and we will work, you know, we'll go through right. where we've made changes yeah. and see if that impacts what about, the comparative analysis. Um, their broker. I think, and I think just collectively brokers will have to keep leaning on it. We just heard, there's still been a lot of pushback. I'm Is there any broker, maybe like the <clears throat> big national brokers that are I think some of, some of them will do it on themselves, but do, do it by themselves, but they basically have to get a lot of information from the TPA. And I've heard quotes as, as much or, you know, as little as $50,000 to yeah. do it. And an accounting firm can't do this. Yeah. I, yeah. This unless is, they have a special a, consulting yeah. firm. Yeah. And unfortunately I've had questions. Can I do this? And, you know, I think you basically need some type of medical background to say, right. okay, here is, here is what we see the cost driver. So here's why we've input it, you know, input this NQTL and here's how we apply it to medical surgical. So what about like a stop loss carrier? You know, they look at um, risk and, yeah, that's a that's a great great point. But I think a lot of times you're getting the you know getting bundled packages yeah, you know from your yeah. TPA and stop loss. So we didn't rehearse all this. <laughs> well, this is what you like to do with me. No, that is not. True. <laughs> so true. I would say to sum it all up, keep I would say keep working with your broker to push on on your TPA to do this. Get what you can, but maybe maybe even talk to them about again getting the comparative analysis for whatever the. Mm -hmm fully insured product your plan is is based on and then you have at least something you can work on a little bit okay uh, i don't know who's going to answer this question are we able to offer salary management staff different benefits than we offer hourly staff and this person says specifically such as the amount of pto paid, paid time off anybody want to comment on that one I can comment about other stuff. I'm not going to comment on PTO. So I think, you know, as a benefit seminar, we may have to leave that. I don't know if our pseudo-employment colleague has any comments on that. <laughs> um, 
Unfortunately not. Yeah, you know, I, I think the PTO is going to be dictated by whatever the applicable state law is. Um, but I know there's generally flexibility there. But, you know, yes, it is generally permissible from a health and welfare perspective to offer different employees different benefits. But of course, you know, just like you do in the retirement side, you have to worry about the non-discrimination provisions. Uh, and those non-discrimination provisions generally apply in two different contexts. You know, one, if you're allowing employees to pay uh, contributions on a pre-tax basis under a cafeteria plan, uh, we have to look at those non-discrimination requirements. And then if you are have a self-funded plan, we have to look at self-funded health plan. Self-funded health plan. Thank you, Mary. Uh, those non-discrimination requirements as well. So actually, if you still, if you're currently fully insured, you're really only uh, subject to the Section 125 non-discrimination requirements. So it's possible, but generally you have to have a bona fide reason why you're offering these different benefits. I think salaried versus hourly would be that bona fide reason. And then maybe you have to do some testing to make sure it doesn't uh, result in, in running a follow these non-discrimination rules. And who wants to comment about the retirement side of this? I think Trip basically covered it, which is it's all subject to non-discrimination testing, which is really the divider of 5% or more owner and uh, uh, $130,000 of compensation. So you could conceivably do different things for hourly and salary, but you'd have to satisfy that test. Okay, awesome. I would just add that for our unionized clients, this is a rather obvious question because, of course, uh, your your hourly employees who are in a union have a set of benefits that are controlled by their collective bargaining agreement, and uh, your non-unionized employees, which would include salary, do do not have benefits controlled by the collective bargaining agreement. So that's just a kind of an obvious example where the benefits for one category of employees diverges from those of another. Brett, would there ever be a state employment law that what might impact PTO um, relative to non-union employees? I think so, but I don't want to say anything definitively. <laughs> there you go. That's wise man. I apologize. No problem. No problem. No problem. Probably the Michigan Wages and Fringe Benefits Act, I think, for example, talks about paying people the benefit. This, that sort of benefit based on the agreement with the employees, whatever the policy says. Yeah, I mean, you generally have flexibility designing your policy. Aside from the, the paid family medical leave act, but once you set that, you got to follow it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to look at 401k for a moment. Uh, some investors are buying the assets of a company and for the most part do not want to change the management or operations of the business. The seller's 401k plan has only existed for a few years and is based upon, um, and everything looks to be in order. Uh, the plan has about 80 participants. Do you recommend that we adopt the plan or have the seller terminate the plan and then establish an identical plan? Frank, you have a thought on that? Well, yes, yeah, since uh, I have several clients that are doing many of these every month, um, we have to, you know, you really have, there's pros and cons to the taking it or not taking it and starting over. And the biggest reason uh, to consider, you know, terminating the old and starting the new is you have no liability as a buyer. You don't have to worry about what happened prior to acquiring. Um, of course, those assets then will all go out the door and you'll have a much smaller plan, which may require you know, higher fees as a percentage of assets. So, there's benefits to taking the plan. The big thing is, and that in that decision is obviously the due diligence is one thing to see if there are any problems. But even if you don't identify any, um, it's really the indemnification. If you are as a buyer indemnified and you have, you know, confidence that you'll be able to, uh, that the seller would be able to satisfy that indemnification requirement, then consider taking the plan. It certainly is easier from that standpoint. It also prevents employees from getting access to all their money and right. possibly doing bad things with it. So um, that's that's probably the key drive. Thank you. Um, now we switch to a health and welfare question. Um, this is for Brett and Tripp. Uh, could you have, um, could you briefly discuss the broker compensation disclosure rules and how the 20% is calculated? 
Oh, I'll let you take that, Brett, but just to point out, we did do a webinar, uh, Brett and I did a webinar in November, which is on this, that was specifically on this broker and consultant compensation disclosure rules or, or statutes. We don't really have any rules or guidance on it yet. Uh, that was in November and is available on the firm's uh, YouTube website. So if you are really interested in this, you can, you can go back, but I, Brett, I'll let you kind of address this question specifically. That's right. So we went into great detail about these requirements in that November webinar, but from a 10,000 foot level um, under the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, which became law last uh, December, uh, there is a new requirement that applies for health plan brokers and consultants. Uh, and that requirement um, means that those brokers and consultants need to disclose certain information including compensation information to group health plan uh, sponsors. And that needs to be done in order for that transaction to avoid being considered a prohibited transaction. And a consequence of not providing these compensation disclosures and being a prohibited transaction is that uh, the plan sponsor or the broker and consultant may be subject to penalties under ERISA. And specifically, there are two ERISA code sections uh, that impose these penalties. And one of them, section 502I, is a discretionary penalty that can be up to 5% of the amount involved in the prohibited transaction. And what I expect the amount involved to be would be the fees that the plan sponsor would be paying to the service provider or the compensation the service provider was receiving from an, another party but didn't disclose yes because i think in most con right. in most contexts this is really going after that insurer uh you know commission's compensation for disclosure so i think it would maybe be that or, or to the extent that whatever they received was more than what was reasonable that's right and there's also a second uh larger penalty under ERISA section 502L, that can be up to 20% penalty on an amount recovered. And that would be an amount recovered uh, should the DOL reach a settlement agreement with the plan sponsor or the broker or consultant, or an amount recovered in an actual lawsuit if the Department of Labor decides to file a lawsuit against the broker or consultant or plan sponsor for failing to comply with these disclosure requirements. It's a good thing, though, don't you think, that employers have more transparency on understanding what their fees are? Yeah, and you know, we discussed this in the webinar last week. Is you know, a lot of times this information is reported on the fifty five hundred or on the Schedule A mm -hmm. of the fifty five hundred, but you're not getting that until after the fact. Right. This is making these disclosures up front, and I think you know, as plan sponsors start to request these, they may be shocked at how much indirect compensation right. these brokers and consultants can sometimes be, be receiving. And helps them maybe shop the market a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Yep. Right. I mean, that was the big thing of the Consolidated Appropriations Act for health and welfare plans was mm -hmm. just everything was kind of geared towards making things more transparent and adding reporting obligations. Well, um, here is a question for any of you. Uh, when employers are thinking about going out to bid for services for things like actuaries, um, which might be for pension or retiree health purposes or benefits attorneys like all of you. Um, how often should that happen? And are they upholding their proper fiduciary responsibilities if they keep the same vendors for decades? Well, I'll take this from the retirement side. And uh, it really, in that context, depends on how the uh, attorneys and actuaries and things are being paid. They're being paid out of plan assets. That's a fiduciary function. Um, then they basically have to be, uh, whoever the fiduciaries are, have to be evaluating that and really that requirement to go out and make sure that you're not overpaying market rates and things would apply. If, as in probably most cases, at least maybe not with actuaries, but with attorneys, um, most cases probably not being paid out of the plan, then there's no obligation to do that at all. It's simply a corporate decision as to whether to keep using that service provider. So 
a uh, big distinction there as to whether those fees are being paid out of plan assets. But Frank, if, if the service provider is managing investments, then it doesn't matter who, where the assets are, where the money is coming from, right? Because you have a duty to monitor your delegated fiduciaries. So once again, you could pay, if you're not paying it out of plan assets, you could pay a service provider a gazillion dollars and there'd be no violation. What you're talking about, I think, is the evaluation of that provider and whether they, you know, for investments are providing good advice as far as diversification, as far as all those other things, and then the internal fees. But externally, any employer, so, so we've talked about that sometimes where somebody really likes their advisor, but their advisor is charging above market rates. Well, as long as the plan's only paying the market rates, that's okay if the employer then decided to pay that above market on, outside of the plan. Yeah, you're right. I was, it's sort of a separate issue, whether the rates are reasonable and whether they're carrying out their fiduciary functions well. Exactly. Yes. Uh, what yeah. about the health and welfare staff? It'll be interesting. I think this kind of dovetails with what Brett was talking about in these compensation disclosures. Because again, if you get this, I mean, the obligation a plan sponsor has is first, if they're not getting disclosures to request it, but it's not something you're just like filing away, right? You're, you should be reviewing them and making sure that the compensation that your service providers are getting are reasonable. Otherwise you are in one of these prohibited transaction carries, uh, or categories. And, and now the nice thing is the IRS excise tax does not apply on the group health and welfare side, uh, but you still could have this prohibited transaction. So I think if you see one of these fees disclosures and you're like, wow, this is a lot more than I ever thought, uh, do we then, you now you may have an obligation to start shopping the market to look for uh, another broker or consultant. You know, really, these these rules are coming about 10 years after the, the disclosure rules in, in the retirement plan world. So I think this is kind of step one, and we'll see where the department goes from this as far as from an enforcement perspective. The other thing I guess I'd say from a retirement plan perspective is that, you know, I, I think go, sort of going to market for service providers makes sense sometimes, even just from a business perspective. I know yes. we have clients who, who mm -hmm. do a fairly regularly... Uh, request for information or request for proposal for record keepers from the plan. And they often find out that they could get better service from somebody else, or they find out that the service they're getting is, is good or is priced correctly. So it's just good to, I think it's just good kind in of a general. Best, best business practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. also the optics of it to participants that uh, it's kind of viewed as a healthy thing to periodically um, just evaluate, right? Yeah, there's a little there's a little tension there in the sense that the employer doesn't want to sort of upset a, a thing like a change like a record keeper change is a big change from the participants' perspective. So they're oftentimes employers will say, well, we don't really even want to think about that. But the fact that you go to market and examine these things doesn't necessarily mean that you need to make that type of a change. Mm -hmm. If anything, it gives you more information. Right. Can I just answer the the tail end of that question a little more directly? The the end of the question was, what if we just keep the same business partner for decades? Is that okay? And let's just say if you are audited by DOL and they see that you've had the same business partner for decades and never even considered looking at another business partner, that would be bad. Um, so you want to have a record of at least periodically going to market or, or looking around. Um, the, the, the rule of thumb I've, I've heard, you guys correct me if you've heard otherwise, is like every three to five years. So you'd at least want to have a record in, in your fiduciary functions that you are every so often looking around to see if you Okay, should. I'm going to press back on you, though. Okay. It, that would be bad. Well, that wouldn't necessarily mean a violation of anything, but it might raise maybe higher scrutiny by the DOL in an audit. Is that what you're saying? I would say there's a pretty strong inference that you've violated the duty to monitor. If, if you just let it, if you let a fiduciary sit and never even question what that would paying, be a fiduciary right. that would that would be a breach right 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 like and not mean, all the vendors are fiduciaries right yes right yeah. I think it goes back to what Frank was saying earlier if you're paying the the service provider out of corporate assets it's not the same kind of concern as if it's being paid out of plan assets unless they're doing unless this is a delegated fiduciary doing fiduciary functions yeah yeah. Yeah, if you have participants paying for record keeping services and you've had the same record keeper for 20 years and the DOL asks the committee during an audit, how did this, uh, what decision, what decisions did you make along the way to select this person? And no one has any idea. I agree with you that, that, yeah. that that's going to be a you don't hurdle, hurdle in the audit, <laughs> audit to deal with. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, Jim, are there any compliance amendments necessary for 401k or 403b plans that still have to be signed this year? Yes, there's one. A couple of years ago, the law regarding hardship withdrawals in 401k and 403b plans were revised. And by now, uh, employers have implemented those changes because they had to be implemented no later than 2020. But the requirement to amend your plan extended to, the, to December 31 of 2021. I would anticipate most employers would have taken care of this uh, amendment requirement. And if you're using a pre-approved plan provided by Bill or Johnson, provided by another financial institution, the per service provider would unlikely, would, would undoubtedly have provided a standard amendment for the adopters of their pre-approved plan. The only caution there is that these rules provide some choices for employers, and sometimes the standard amendment done by the financial institution uh, may not correspond with how you chose to administer the new rules. And for some of those uh, employers, we're doing custom amendments. Uh, and I don't know the next part of the question. The next is, part of the question <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is there anything that has to be, any amendments for compliance that has to be signed by the end of next year? And the answer is yes. And this is gonna be a broader uh, set of amendments because by the end of the 2022, you're required to amend for the CARES Act and the SECURE Act. You recall that the CARES Act included optional retirement plan provisions, which allowed participants who were affected by COVID to receive in-service distributions out of a retirement plan at a time and in an amount they otherwise wouldn't have been eligible for. It also change some of the loan rules for people who were affected by COVID. Those were temporary rules during 2020. Um, many employers implemented them, but the duty to amend your plan for those CARES Act changes, if you adopted any of them, extends till the end of 2022. The SECURE Act also has the deadline of the end of 2022. Um, those are broader amendments they deal with things like the new required minimum distribution rules and, and a series of other things. But that should be on your radar for next year. Once again, if you're using a pre-approved plan, uh, the provider of the pre-approved plan may have standard amendments to comply with these rules. If you're not using one of those plans, you should be working with your plan provider to make the necessary amendments. Okay. Um, question for Brett and Tripp. Uh, I heard that Illinois recently passed a law requiring employers to disclose certain group health plan information to their employees. Could you briefly describe the new law and what it requires and who it applies to? Yeah, I'll take this. So on August 27 of this year, uh, the Illinois, Illinois passed a new law that basically says that employers uh, that have employees who reside in Illinois who are eligible for their health insurance option have to provide them with a disclosure about whether that health insurance option covers each one of Illinois' uh, required essential health benefits. Mm -hmm. um, this new disclosure that the Department of Illinois, uh, the Department of Labor in Illinois, or Illinois Department of Labor, issued a, a model template in the form of a spreadsheet. Um, it's a pretty simple template, um, but it does look like you're maybe going to have to have a separate template for each medical plan option. But again, this is gonna to have to be provided uh, to anybody who's eligible for your group health plan um, and is a resident of Illinois. Now, so here if I'm a Michigan employer and I have some Illinois employee, employees that are working from home in Illinois, I'm- Yeah, so when, and obviously we're having more and more employers where that's applicable to. And, and what I'm sure many people are saying is, well, I have a self-funded plan, I can rely on ERISA preemption. Well. The, De the Illinois Department of Labor's at least initial take is this is a notice requirement, not really an administration requirement. Uh, so therefore would not be subject to ERISA preemption. So if you go to their FAQ plans, their position is that ERISA does not preempt you. So if you have a self-funded plan, 
you still got to provide well, these disclosures. Maybe you and Brett should fight that on behalf of our <laughs> self <they're, they're>, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the amazing litigators that we are, right? <laughs> <laughs> so keep in mind, there is no, um, so you got to provide disclosure upon hire annually. So you're probably going to want to drop it in with your annual open enrollment materials. Uh, and, and then upon request, you can provide it simply by emailing it or putting it on a, on a website that an employee has regular access to. So actually, there's a little bit easier disclosure when it comes to electronic disclosure rules. Uh, but if you have, a, even if you have a self-funded plan, if you have res, Illinois employees uh, who are eligible for health insurance, you have to provide it. There's no indication on when these are required to be provided. There is potentially penalties. So you know, kind of the the general consensus is, you know, if you're going through your open enrollment right now you know, get them prepared, stick them in there, or maybe try to do a blanket distribution as soon as possible and then and then roll it into kind of your annual disclosure uh, scheme going forward. Right, and I'll just add uh, that the law was effective when passed. So as of August 27th of this year, that law is immediately effective. But we haven't heard anybody, we haven't heard any enforcement action taken or any stories of enforcement action taken for employers that, frankly, probably a lot of them don't even know right. about this, especially yeah. if you only got yeah. a handful of employees. And, 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 and unfortunately, I'm guessing other states may follow suit. I could be. I assume the feds have not yet weighed in whether they think federal preemption applies. No, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sure they won't. And, and if they do, I'm sure they would only say, yeah, we agree that it doesn't <laughs> apply. And they, I mean, in the in the efforts of trying to over notify our participants about everything benefit related, this fits right in there. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, your broker can help you with that. <laughs> um, so Frank, this is a pretty specific question um, and hopefully it will be of interest to others on the call. Starting next year, there's an employer that's considering paying their quarterly bonuses to the profit sharing plan, principally to save payroll taxes. And the bonuses are going to be treated as a profit sharing contribution to the qualified plan and will satisfy IRS non-discrimination requirements. Um, the plan has a three-year cliff vesting schedule for its normal profit sharing contributions. This client uh, wants to know if they can have a second vesting schedule for the profit sharing contributions so that the bonuses are 100% vested. And if so, is there any concern about the highly compensated who are participating in the plan versus the non highs? I'm not sure why there would be any concern about the highly compensated versus non highs if you've satisfied non discrimination with respect to the contribution. Um, but I think the bigger question is whether you can have that second vesting schedule because these are both considered uh, non-elective type contributions. I think it's possible um, if they can be characterized differently, distinguished somehow. I think personally that this would be a classic situation where I'd want to get an IRS determination letter on the language if I was going to put that in a plan before going ahead with it, because they do seem to have some concern about uh, once you're 100% vested in a source of contribution, then you always need to be, and whether these would really be considered two different two sources, sources yeah. I'm not sure. But the likelihood of getting a determination letter, what time-wise, what's that looking like? Yeah, I mean, or price wise. Well, uh, <laughs> but at least if you're on a volume submitter document and you had this in there, so $800 user fee, but you're right, it, you're not going to get it until later next year, probably. Yeah. Right. So, um, okay, uh, Jim, I understand that the SECURE Act added new provisions to expand the opportunity for long term part timers to participate in a 401k plan. Uh, what are these provisions and what are they affecting? Congress has been concerned that some long-term part-time employees never become eligible to participate in the employer's 401k plan. An employer is permitted to uh, impose a one-year thousand-hour requirement, and there are some part-time employees that never work a thousand hours a year and who are, as a result, excluded from participation. Under the SECURE Act, there is a new provision that would say for a long-term part-time employee, that you will become eligible to participate if you have three years in a row where you work at least 500 hours. Now, 
How does that work in, in reality? The way the rules are structured, the three-year period started January 1, 2021. So the first time a, an employee would be eligible under these rules would be for 2024. They'd have to have 500 hours in 2021, 2022, and 2023. If they satisfied that requirement, they'd be eligible to make 401k contributions. There still is no obligation that the employer provide employer contributions, no match, no non-elective contributions for these employees. They just have to be permitted to make 401k contributions. Like the reason to talk about this is from your standpoint as a plan sponsor, are you tracking the hours of these part-time employees starting in 2021? Because it's a three-year look back period starting with the 2021 year. So even though this may not impact who's in your plan until 2024, <coughs> you need to recognize from an employer standpoint that you may need to be having the infrastructure to track the hours that when you get to 2024, you can identify which employees this potentially applies to. Some of you may already be more generous and allow people to participate uh, without a thousand hour requirement. And it could be that you already would satisfy this requirement, so it'll be a non-issue. It's also a non-issue for a 403B plan because under a 403B plan, all employees are required to be eligible to make elective contributions. So this is really a 401k plan issue, uh, but it's something that needs to be on your radar if your plan provisions currently have rules that would exclude uh, the, the kind of long-term part-time employees that we've been talking about. All right, with that, we have run out of time. Um, we hope everybody on the on the webinar has enjoyed this. I know that I had fun. Thanks again, Mary, for coming back. And everybody have a happy holiday season, and we will see you next year.